Hello everyone, welcome to this week's Product School webinar. Thanks for joining us today. Just in case you didn't know, Product School offers product management certificates online and at over 20 campuses worldwide. On top of that, every week we offer some amazing local product management events and host online webinars, live streams, and Ask Me Anything sessions. Head over to productschool.com after this webinar to check them out. Hello, folks, and welcome to the webinar uh, Idea to Product Market Fit. So tonight we're going to be talking about how do you move from an idea or product idea to achieving product market fit. Uh, so before we get to the webinar itself, uh, just a very quick introduction about myself. Uh, that's my name on the, on the screen, Mauricio Franzoni. I'm currently living in Melbourne. I'm a product manager, senior product manager at Nintex, which is a workflow automation tool, a process automation platform. Um, so a bit of my journey so far. So I've been working product for, you know, a good number of years. Uh, for now, like back before that, I had a, you know, background in working as a, a business analyst and a data analyst as well. Um, so I guess like what drives me so in terms of, you know, as a product man manager, um, you know, you dare really to solve important customer problems and keep solving it better than you did yesterday. So that's one of the key things that for, it's quite important for me as well. Uh, working with amazing product people, obviously product is a, you know, it's a functional, it's a functioning organization that is growing a lot and is evolving quite a lot over the last few years. So I really like to always engage with, you know, other product people that I can actually learn a lot from as well. Uh, taking risks is a way to move forward. It's a, it's a very important thing as a product manager. You're going to be expected to make decisions about products. Uh, so, you know, be able to take the risks with confidence is quite important as well. Um, and then obviously leveraging data to make better decisions is a, is a critical thing as well. You know, a lot of people talk about being data driven, but you know, not necessarily they are data driven. So being data driven is quite important. So that's something uh, enough about myself. We can just move straight into, um, you know, the webinar itself tonight, which we're going to be talking about product market fit. And that's a, such a kind of critical topic. Everyone keeps talking about that. And it goes back to, you know, achieving product success. So if you think about product success, specifically in the digital space or consumer space, uh, obviously you're going to remember you know, so, some of these brands that you can see on the screen right now. So for example, you know, Slack, Dropbox, Spotify, and Instagram. And obviously, you know, the numbers actually talk by, you know, for themselves. So for example, like, you know, Slack, currently they've got over like 10 million plus active daily active users, which is a huge number of daily active users. Dropbox as well, they've got over 5 million, 500 million plus users with like 1.2 billion kind of daily uploads in, in, like, in the product as well. Uh, Spotify with over a billion kind of monthly active users, and obviously Instagram with you know over 230 million monthly active users. So obviously, as you can see here, these products have, they have been quite successful. Uh, very likely, you are a user of those products. I am a user of on pretty much all those products on the screen right now. But the question really is, and specifically when we try to talk about product market fit, is you know what do do they all have in common? What they all have in common is that they did achieve product market fit. And what does it mean in very simple terms is that they had a um, they were in a strong market with many users like sharing the same like the same problem, and the, the product they developed managed to actually solve or address the problem really well. So basically, you have that kind of fit between a product solution to customers or many customers with a, a problem in their life they wish there was a product for or solution for. Um, there's other ways to explain these, like Dan Olson is a very kind of well-known guy as well. He's got this theory or this actually framework called, you know, the product market fit pyramid. Uh, there's a hyperlink here on the presentation. You can actually watch this later. You know, there's a whole bunch of videos on YouTube, etc. But he talks about it in a similar fashion where, you know, you, under you, you understand the market you're trying to play. So you understand the kind of the mass market you're trying to address the problem for. You understand like what the under underserved needs of the market are. So for example, it may be there are solutions currently in the market, but not really addressing um, you know, the customer need. Uh, and then you actually figure out a solution with your value proposition that's appealing off to the market or can actually address that problem really well or better than everyone else, even better than what the current solution is, right? So that's when you achieve like the product market fit space is very much when a product solution addresses an underserved need of you know, many customers in the market, for example. So if you wanted to explain in even more simple terms, 
like a product market fit is not something that you 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 know you achieve like in you know in there's a secret formula to achieving that or you know exactly when you achieve it uh, actually like you know mark anderson actually d- does say that if you need to ask if you achieve product market fit very likely you haven't just because product market fit is such a thing where uh, as a product manager you can see like organic adoption of a product um you know you can see like users adopting a feature or product as fast as you can put it in the market and we can if you if you took those examples that we just went through before it's very much been the case for them where the product they put a product out there and once they achieve product market feed they've seen the kind of traction in terms of the product uh, adoptions in the product um and that was when they kind of moved from not not achieving product market feed to achieving product market feed so the graph here on the right hand side kind of does try to explain that in more simple terms as well which is a product is starting from an idea, uh, not having any adoption, not or having very low traction for the product, and then through like various iterations, eventually, like they uh, did achieve a solution that was a solution fit to you know the many customers' problems, right? And that's when you can see the very kind of organic adoption of a solution as a way to solve a customer problem. Now, the thing about product market fit is, you know, it, it is actually really hard. It's not as simple as just saying like you know develop and I have an idea you know put a product out there you know very you know very quickly people just adopt it and you're gonna be kind of rich and with many millions of users and etc and so on. It's not really the case. It's actually really hard. And if you look at you know here on the right hand side again, the top reason why like startups fail is because they either develop a solution where there was no market need. Or they develop a solution that they believe there was a market need, or they believe it was actually solving someone's problem, but in fact it wasn't solving any anyone's problem. It was just pretty much just either an innovation or an idea for a, a problem that wasn't shared by many people. Therefore, you know they fail to actually succeed or achieve product market fit. And obviously, you know there's a whole bunch of other reasons why startups fail. But to the topic we're talking tonight, I really want to hone in like to the number one cause, which is developing a solution to a product that does not exist or is not shared by many people, right? Now, the thing about product market fit, which is quite important to realize as well, is the fact that, you know, it may be that, you know, at the beginning of an idea, you're not really there yet. And you need to really adopt like the kind of lean approach to product development, which is, you know, you build a little bit, you put it out there, you talk to users, you know, iterate based on the feedback, and then you, you do it again, you know, refine that, you know, version of the prototype, and if we go out there, talk to users again, or again and again, until you can actually a, a find or achieve product market fit. And Airbnb is a classic example of, you know, a, a company that started like, you know, in 2007 for very much an idea of a problem that, you know, a couple of these guys here having where they were living in San Francisco, you know, they're short in cash. There was an industrial kind of design conference. They realized that a lot of their friends wanted to come to the conference, but hotels were not available, right? So they thought, well, why don't we, you know, rent like the free space or living room space uh, to some of the design friends to come over and actually stay and be able to attend the conference, right? So that's when they sort of thought, you know what, rather than just doing for our friends, let's open up and create like this kind of website called Air Bed and Breakfast platform, which the whole value proposition was about coming, there's an air bed that we put in our living room, we, you know, serve you breakfast and off you, off you go. So from that idea, like they, they pretty much spend, you know, two years sort of like we're trying to refine the idea, various iterations, try to get funding to then finally, like after, you know, various feedbacks and incorporating feedback from, you know, various people, they managed to get their first like serious round of funding back in 2009. So from the beginning of an idea, it took them around two years to actually does, you know, to do achieve somewhat product market fit. But really, like product market fit really came for them when they they seen first an attraction in the product in terms of adoptions, right? So they went on from 2009 to 2011 to being present in 89 countries, over a million bookings um, in the, in the platform and so on. But the, so the journey wasn't easy. Like so, they, they spent at least two, three, four years from moving from an idea and various iterations before they actually managed to achieve the kind of product market fit, right? Now, the important thing to highlight here is with product market fit, which is you have to go back to the principles of like, you know, building MVPs and the fact that your starting point 
it does not, ne not necessarily has to be perfect, right? The starting point or the most important thing you need to do is to actually, you know, there's a problem that I believe, you know, many customers are, are having. I can actually come up with a solution on a series of hypotheses that I can actually quickly test with users and put it out there. So Airbnb, as you can see here on the screen, one of the kind of first kind of prototypes of MVPs or versions of the, the product, um, very much focused on like solving that kind of core uh, cost customer problem, which was allowing people to actually stay in the living room and not paying a lot of money, right? And, and that kind of really kind of started like a sharing economy, right? So if you, if you imagine things that we take for granted today, for example, you know, automated payments or integrated payments, uh, having like a way to search in a map or having like a map view, uh, having people, everyone working full time in the business, those things were not there present for them when they started, right? So the beginnings for them or the MVP version wasn't perfect at all, wasn't even close to being perfect, but uh, the product itself was very, very much addressing an unmet market need back then. And if you imagine like how obviously the product evolved over the last, you know, 11 years, um, you know, now the product has grown to not only having stays, but they've got plus, they've got experiences. They, you know, they just launched, I think, early in the year. They've got luxury uh, stays and things like that. And obviously the business itself today, you know, is valued over $31 billion in valuation. So, I mean, from like a humble start where they focus on, solving or serving like a serving the unaddressed market need to a product today that has such a massive valuation i mean the most important thing here to realize is that they did took very much the lean approach that we can actually learn from it which is they focus on speech market so the website that as you can see before it was very simple website did not have a whole bunch of capabilities that you know again we take for granted today but they focus on you know what let's get some ideas out there like that speed to market right Focus on it as many iterations until they achieve product market fit. Same thing, like, so from 2007 when they started to 2019, very much like the website or the product went through various iterations were over like, you know, lean approach of, you know, building, going out there, talking to users, measuring, refining, and, and putting out there another version of the feature. All those many iterations helped them not only achieve product market fit, but remain with product market fit, meaning that once you achieve product market fit, it's very important for you to keep kind of the mindset of, you know, you need to keep evolving and solving the problem better than you did yesterday. Otherwise, someone else will come and, and do it better than you're doing today. And that product market fit that you used to have, it's going to be gone, right? And here, like, you know, it's very much a, by adopting a lean approach uh, is very much allowing them to, it is the quickest way to learn because it's one thing for you to have an idea. If you don't really go out there and talk to people, get out of the building, you're not going to know whether the idea has legs or not. So going out there, uh, talking to users, um, and taking the learnings back to either people to persevere, that's the most important thing as well. So there was one, uh, one quote by uh, Reid Hoffman as well that talks about that concept of MVPs, which is, in order for you to actually learn, you have to ship. So if you're not embarrassed for like by the first version of MVP, it means you should actually ship too late. So rather than keep adding more and more features and, you know, just, you know, bloating and a potential MVP, you're better off, you know, getting a pro you know, an idea, a prototype out there, testing with users, that, that's going to give you a lot more learnings that you can actually use to iterate the product as opposed to investing time, resources, and money in building an actual solution, right? So in this session, like in the next, I think, 15 minutes, uh, and I guess a very short session, and apologies if I'm going a little bit fast, is because you know, we're very much time constrained here. But so this session, we're going to be going through like, you know, those three things. So we spoke about product market feed. We give a very brief explanation of what it is. So how do we, first of all, uh, source product ideas? That's, so that's the most important thing. Like, you know, where do ideas come from? How do I actually source them? Once I actually get them, how do I actually form hypotheses and actually move and do some customer discovery, uh, customer development, and I can actually move that idea to being like an MVP. And we're going to talk about some different, you know, implementation strategies of MVP. And then we're going to be talking thirdly, like lastly, the different implementation strategies you can actually use to fast track your path to product market fit, which is quite important as well. It means that, you know, over time, as, as a product idea comes from an idea to an actual working product, you can apply various different strategies to actually, you know, um, evolve that idea from that an idea to an actual uh, working solution for users, right? 
So starting with sourcing product ideas. So there are many ways you can actually source ideas for your product. So the first one here we're going to look at is dog fooding. So dog food is, means, you know, you actually, you got a problem in your life. You wish there's a solution for, you know, go out, you actually go out and do like a, you know, prototype and then you actually use your own problem as a way to evolve an idea, right? Or companies that start off by saying, you know, oh, we've got a problem. Uh, there's an engineer, like as part of the, you know, startup founders, let's build like a very small iteration of the product uh, that we can actually, you know, put out there and actually tell us amongst ourselves if, if like, you know, the products, that product solution does address at least our own problems, right? And if it does address it, then the next step would be, let's go out there and talk to users, right? So dog food is very much taking a problem in your life, building a solution or coming up with a solution for that, and then testing out and seeing if that can actually solve your problem. The second one, which is, I mean, obviously, once you actually got that kind of a, an early prototype out there, you can actually observe how you're actually using the, you know, the product in the field or observe how they're actually interacting with like, you know, a, a let's say a clickable prototype, for example, and whether they find it easy or they demonstrating that, you know, they would be willing to adopt the solution to solve their problem anyway. That, that also applies to, you know, working products where, you know, you're looking to evolve or enhance or iterate the product solution. And then, you, you know, you're looking to test new ideas for new screens and new user flows. And again, observing users in the field can help you sort of evolve or figure out whether, you know, the user flow you came up with or the solution does address a customer problem. And lastly, which is again, not so much related to a kind of, you know, initial product idea, but mostly related to, let's say, you've got a, pro a product out there, you're launching features, you know, every two weeks, or every four weeks, and then you're noticing like, you know, a, you know, pattern of or a trend in terms of support tickets. So analyzing support tickets can help you, you know, better pick up where users are struggling with in your product. It may be that, you know, you come up with a new product, you know, the, the user flow, you, you know, you have it as an idea, even though you, you test with users, they might be struggling a lot with. So analyze support tickets can help you, again, figure out new ideas for how to evolve the product, how to introduce new features, or even how to introduce like new green fields kind of functionality or features or even new products as well on the back of user's feedback. So, I mean, the most important thing about around sourcing those product ideas here is the fact that in all of these cases here, uh, you're gonna be eventually touching on the key point of, you gotta go out there, you gotta talk to users, you actually have to listen as a way to learn and evolve the idea. So now let's call it, let's, we've got an idea uh, and you manage to actually get, you know, move on from just being an idea to having like an early prototype. How do you actually move from that idea to an MVP that can be tested and you can actually gain more insights around whether the product solution does address a customer problem or whether your product solution does have legs, that, meaning that it can actually grow into an actual product, right? So there's a five step, step process here. Very quickly, we're gonna cover for getting to your MVP. So the first one is like figure out what problem you're solving and for whom. So that's the most important thing as well. And, I, and again, the what we spoke about last slide, which is, you know, figure out what the problem is, coming up with a way to sort of like form a hypothesis and test with users and, you know, interview, you know, users or customers or potential customers, get the validation whether you know, the same problem that you experienced today, more people share that. So that's the first step. So step number two is that, you know, the, all those things in step number one here, at this point in time, we have very much as assumptions about a potential problem that people may have. So a way to go about doing this in a structured way would be you gotta form hypotheses. They are testable hypotheses that you can actually go out there, get out of the building, and actually talk to potential early adopters of your product and see like whether you know they can actually give you feedback or prove or disprove the hypothesis that you have. So in some cases, the most important thing here is that you know if you form a hypothesis, you went out there and spoke to people, you got the validation, great still take the learnings, refine that, and go out there and do it again until you, you achieve a, in a stage where you can actually build a product, a product solution, a working product, uh, and people will be willing to pay for it. If you don't have the validation, if you're actually being disproved, try to figure out what else you can actually do. It may be that a small pivot in your solution can lead you to achieving product market fit as well. And there's many examples of products that they did not start as they are today, like for example, Slack, it was just like, you know, a feature within a gaming uh, solution that was developed that allow kind of gamers to communicate in different channels throughout when they're doing like online gaming, right? And by, by picking up that only that single feature 
and putting out there as a, you know, a standalone solution, Slack pretty much was born and they managed to again achieve product market fit. So quickly in terms of hypothesis here, you know, it's important to highlight that it's just a starting, starting point, has to be testable. Uh, it has to start from your questions and assumptions. And obviously you need to be prioritizing the risks and assumptions you wanna test. Um, and again, the reason why they exist is to be either proven or disproven as well. So if customers like they give you like, you know, the negative feedback or the opposite feedback, take that on board as a learning and actually iterate or pivot uh, your product as well. And here there's just some kind of very brief examples of how to best write a hypothesis as well. And I believe you have access to the deck after this webinar, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. So once you do, uh, you went out there, spoke to users, obviously you need to get a basic understanding, at least a baseline understanding of the target market and the landscape as well. Like how many competitors are in the market? You know, look at the, the current solutions in the market. How, how are they addressing? How they position them, themselves to actually solve the customer problem? And why are they getting traction or not getting traction in terms of, you know, adoptions and things like that? So number three, like understanding the market, understanding the landscape, it is quite important as well, especially to make sure you're not entering a market is gonna be really hard to, you know, gain market share or gain adoptions because, you know, there's a high switching cost, for example, for you to come and start using your product. The last few steps very quickly again, um, using those insights to again define your MVP. So it might be they started with the early customer discovery, customer development, you did not have any working product, you're very much like just questions, hypotheses they had, and then you did a lot of interviews, and then you wanna use those discovery like in insights to define the MVP strategy you're gonna adopt, right? And then the MVP strategy, which we're gonna be talking about next and it last, is very much around you know building, testing, learning, going out there, iterating, and then pivoting and persevering until you can actually reach product market fit. As we've seen some of those examples before as well, like for Airbnb, they went through like you know many rounds of iterations before they really you know achieve like a product market fit or they achieve enough like mass adoption of the product uh, to actually grow and then start focusing on like growing the product as opposed to like product market fit. So again, this is just again like a very quick recap on you know where do you start like with a hunch of a problem they've got an idea for. Uh, do you do some customer research like you from the hypothesis? You go out there talk to people. Then you got enough information to start, sort of start building MVP, which is very much, you know, there's a desire for that solution and it's feasible. Like I can build a solution for a technical point of view that can actually address that. And then obviously you keep iterating these. You may decide to launch a beta version or beta testing version for some users or like early adopters. And then in doing so, you can actually start testing more things. You can test, you know, whether uh, users willing to pay, how much they're willing to pay, how should I be positioning my product? And that's going to give you whether that product itself is a viable product in an actually viable market as well. And that's kind of where, uh, if you achieve those three things, that really like the sweet spot in between the three of you know being a desirable product, feasible and viable, you're going to see like you know organic adoptions of a product solution. So that's just more like you know an explanation of what we've seen before, but just in terms of the, the process itself. And again, just as, as a recap, like over time like from the, a hunch of an idea to an actually implemented solution, you're gonna be going through like various rounds of you know uh, product versions per se, which would, they might start with just a small proof of concept. They might go through like, you know, a, like a prototype, which may not be a working prototype. Ideally, it's not gonna be a working prototype, it might just be a clickable prototype. The good thing today is like, there's many tools out there you can actually use to just test screens or test user flows without coding anything. And then you move on to then obviously piloting and then achieving like a working version of your MVP. And that leads to like the, the third section of this, you know, the webinar tonight, we talks about how do you fast track your way to product market fee? So as we mentioned before, like the good news is that in terms of MVP implementation strategies is that you don't need to code anything to test your hypothesis. So you don't need to have to invest time and money like with resources and development in order to actually have a product that you can actually go out there and test with users, right? You can actually start very simple. So there are various implementation strategies for MVPs. You can start from like no product to a minimal working product, which is actually a working solution, right? And there's things such as, you know, a smoke test as we call it, which it might be a landing page. So landing page might be, you know, obviously put out there a landing page where the, you know, the most important thing you're trying to do here is capture leads. 
you want to sell the value proposition you want to see people uh, they actually spark an interest you want to see they want to you know give up the email address or sign up to you know whatever like you pro you propose your offering to them at this point in time here you know it might be a good strategy in, in terms of you know recruiting early adopters to keep sort of like evolving or doing more, more and more customer discovery right so these days very likely it's going to be the MVP that's going to you know validate whether you've got a solution that is a viable solution it's going to be very much a starting point a way to capture early adopter leads that can help you evolve that so another alternative to this would be you know selling before you build so the you know various examples we're going to go through next like a Kickstarter page or a crowd crowdsourcing page or crowdfunding page where you know you've got a product idea you might invest some time in like designing some high level concepts of what the product will look like that can work for both like software but mostly like hardware products as well um, and then they can actually you know validate whether people will be willing to pay for the solution or they they would you know be willing to sort of support that idea being developed further right so that's again a kickstarter page and at this point in time here again there's no product there's no coding whatsoever it's very much just you know using some early versions or implementation strategies of an MVP to get the validation whether you know people will be willing to pay for it or at, at, at least whether they would be willing to use the product in the first place and then we're going to be going to the next uh, about other ways as we evolve or like for me a concierge MVP which technically there's a business but you know the website itself is still manual in the back end uh, Wizard of Oz which again there's no business whatsoever it might be just a shell where you again you're trying to prove the point or prove a specific hypothesis to then move into a single feature MVP which again it's a working product that focus on only one feature and then you know in seeing you adoptions of that product based on that functionality you're very sure that you know you're on the right track uh, to keep evolving each rated product so if you about implementation strategies for MVPs that not necessarily have to adopt all of them uh, you may actually start this administrator by having a single feature MVP if that makes sense to your product solution it may be that you know if it's just an idea you haven't actually invested a lot of time in developing you may start by landing page trying to more doing kind of lead capture and doing further customer discovery or you may apply all of the five here you know if you want to move on like in a, a little bit faster as well so there's some ex examples here like you know in terms of use cases that might be relevant to you as well so if you know the canva the website like templates that can help you you know building the designs very quickly with no code um so canva started like them one of the first mvp uh strategies they applied was having a landing page where they sort of created some secrecy around what product they're building uh some information here and again uh please sign up to learn more and then obviously on the back of this they use those early adopters to sign up here to sort of like you know keep doing customer discovery further uh, research and then helping them whenever they went out with you know a working product or either single version or a single feature MVP sorry they had enough information inside to actually do that uh, crowdsourcing as I mentioned before like a classic example of crowdsourcing that really worked well was Pebble uh, if you're not old enough to know what Pebble was kind of one of the first if not the first like smartwatch that came like many years ago and you know back then when they launched the Kickstarter page uh, that product did not exist at you know at all it was very much an idea as a concept and then on the back of the, you know the campaign they were probably like one of the highest campaigns back in the day where you know they you know raised over like 10 million dollars um, and that was actually very much approved that you know people were actually willing to to buy their product solution right so that, that was another another way but at this point in time here very much a concept some you know conceptual designs and creating like a crowdsourcing page in Kickstarter or leveraging another platform to do this without investing any money to, to code or even build the watch itself moving to like more something that is more concrete like a concierge MVP uh, it's where the business itself already exists so if you if you know the history of Groupon where you know they started and they had already a business where you know people they, they wanted to validate whether whether people would be willing to pay uh, for group deals uh, so at this point in time here the website was very much I believe was like a WordPress template um, that look real if you press on a button buy now you will not actually technically buy that it would actually save your email address to a spreadsheet 
And then if they achieved like, you know, a certain number of people signing up to the deal, which, you know, means the deal would actually go through, then they would take those individual email addresses and then manually generate invoices and then manually send the tickets to those individuals, right? So it was pretty much like a working shell where, you know, from a user's perspective, um, the, the website itself was up and running, but everything in the, in the back was actually manual. Um, and obviously that confirmed the hypothesis or validated the hypothesis without any investment in automation, right? Obviously this model here does not, you know, scale, but does prove the concept. So of, from here, you know, in getting those, the revenue coming in and getting the validation, you're able to then invest, you know, automating all the, the you know, the backend process and things like that. Now the implementation strategy was, you know, Wizard of Oz. So Zappos is a you know, really famous use case where, you know, there was this, um, you know, this guy in the US and he wanted to prove or that people would, would be willing to pay or buy shoes online. So at this point in time, if you imagine you take it for granted today because, you know, e-com is a big thing and it's actually a lot of higher, it's actually growing a lot faster than, you know, brick and mortar retail. But, you know, back in the day when Zappos was born, um, e-com wasn't such a thing. And specifically buying shoes online was not a thing because, you know, people wanted to go to the store. They want to see, they want to, hold the shoes in their hands. They want to try it on, make sure it fits well. So what, they, what he's done again, adopting a very MVP strategy of, you know, let's, I'm going to come up with another working that looks like a real shell. Um, I'm going to go out there to physical stores. I'm going to take photos of shoes. I'm going to post them online in this website. And whenever someone clicks on a button at your cart to purchase that, I'm going to physically go to the store, purchase those shoes and then ship the product manager to the user. In doing so, again, he got the validation he needed that, you know, people would be willing to, you know, purchase shoes online. And then by this point in time here, when he launched the first version, you know, the website itself was very much as a shell. I believe, again, it was a WordPress template. But it did help test the risky assumption around buying shoes online before he bought any inventory, invest in any warehousing or anything like that. Last one we're going to go cover tonight is a single feature MVP. So again, um, Foursquare, like, you know, back in the day, I mean, again, if you're old enough, you would know what Foursquare is. So back in the day, like how they started, it was very much a single feature MVP. where only allowed users to check in with their location and then earn gamification points and badges. That was all. There, was, there wasn't anything else. They did not overcook like the MVP. They focused on, okay, we can get a, you know, early version with a single feature working out there very quickly. Uh, and these are the our hypotheses that we have. And, you know, by seeing people adopting the product very quickly, they realize they're actually into something. And obviously, product itself grew and over time, and then the history is, is there to tell itself. So, conclusion is like, in order for you to move quickly from idea to product market fit, make sure customers want your product in the first place. Make sure the problem you're trying to solve is shared by many people. If it's not shared by many people, then very likely you're going to succeed and move. You may be able to move from an idea to like an early version of a product, but very likely you're gonna achieve product market fit or the organic adoption attraction of your product. Number two, adopting a lean approach, focus on speed to market. Again, we went through like some of the implementation strategies that can help you fast track your way from an idea to product market fit. Make sure you have the lean mindset in mind whenever you're coming up with or you're trying to move your idea for just being on the paper to actually being like a, you know, a working product. And last but not least, I think that's one of the most important things, specifically if you're a product manager out there, fall in love with a customer problem, not your solution. So if you're wrong, like if an idea for a feature or product or whatnot did not work, did not get any traction, no adoptions, make sure you try to actually go out there, keep talking to users about their problem. At the end of the day, a solution will only become a problem, a, a product that can solve a customer problem if it does address the customer problem and the problem is actually shared by many people. So fall in love with your customer problem. Keep trying to find ways to solve the problem better than it did yesterday. And if you do this, then very, like, very likely you're going to be able to move your idea to a product that's going to grow and achieve product market fit. And with that said, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, my name is Mauricio Franzoni and I thank you so much for the opportunity.